Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2, we're going to look at verses 41 through 47. We're going to read those. Responsively, we begin together on 41, then I read 42. We alternate till we end together on verse 47 of Acts chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Ready? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common." And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved." And let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now and we ask your blessing upon the reading of our scripture tonight and that you would continue to prepare us and make our hearts ready to receive the truth that you have for us this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit here in the church and thank you, Lord, for the good music tonight. Uh, it's just uh, been a wonderful service and we pray that you'll continue to speak to us and to minister to hearts. Bless the special as, as it's given, Lord, and I pray each of us will be ready to give you our undivided attention when we come to the preaching of your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Be thou exalted forever and ever. God of eternity, the ancient of days, wondrous in wisdom, majestic in glory, perfect in holiness, and worthy of praise. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels, be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Be thou exalted, O Son of the Highest, Savior of sinful man, Redeemer and King, one with the Father, co equal in glory. Humbly we come to thee, our homage we bring. Be thou exalted, by seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted, with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Be thou exalted. Spirit of power, dwelling within our hearts to keep us from sin. God of the ages and Lord of salvation, ruler of heaven and earth, high praises we presume. May thou exalt thy seraphs and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their hands of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. That's good. Thinking as they were singing that, 
I think there's one person out there that really enjoyed that, and uh, has to be their mother. Amen. Is this this doesn't sound quite right. Give me whatever needs to be done. Give me a little bit more if you can. All right, Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for again the opportunity to open up your Word and look at it together tonight. And I pray you'd help us as we look into this this chapter here in Acts and the example of the early church as we prepare for what uh, we trust you will give us next Sunday on our Turkey Dinner Sunday 2018. And so Lord, help us tonight and minister to our hearts, uh, both those here in the auditorium and others who are listening by way of the live stream. I pray Lord that you will speak to our hearts and help us. Give us, as Brother Xavier prayed, what we need for this coming week. Uh, that you would use us and we would be vessels of honor unto you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. wanted to talk to you tonight and just kind of have a family meeting, so to speak, about our big day coming up. Um, that there's a Bible precedent for having a big day. Uh, what we just read in Acts chapter 2 was a uh, normal big day because it was the Feast of Pentecost. And uh, as you read chapter 2, if you, we went back to the beginning, you would find out that there were people gathered out of every nation under heaven at the time, and uh, they were all gathered together for that feast, and that was an opportunity uh, as the Lord brought the Holy Spirit in power upon the apostles, and really upon 120 in the upper room, and they preached the gospel that day. And when they preached the gospel that day, they preached Jesus Christ and how you could be saved by faith in Christ. Uh, 3,000 people received Christ as their Savior. You said, well, how did all those people from other nations, how did they understand what was being said? Well, God gave these apostles or these people who were preaching the opportunity, the ability to speak languages that the, they'd never spoken before. And uh, it wasn't an unknown language, it was a language of these people gathered throughout the different countries of the world, and they heard the gospel being preached in their language. So they understood. They understood that they were sinners, they understood they needed a Savior, they understood that Jesus was a Savior they needed, and they wanted to receive Christ as their Savior. And so 3,000 were saved, and 3,000 followed the Lord in baptism that day. That's a pretty big day. Uh, can you think about the church that 120 gathered in an upper room and you find out by the next Sunday when they were going to meet, they had to find a place for 3,120. Uh, that's quite a bit of church growth there in a week, isn't it? And uh, can you imagine that, having that problem? Uh, and, and the truth is, they didn't have anywhere that, that was sized that they could meet and so they began to just meet house to house and they began to have smaller groups and they met where they could and how they could but the church grew. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit tonight. First, I'm going to give you seven reasons why we ought to have a big day. We have a big day here in the fall with the dinner day. We aim for a big day in the spring with the country fair uh, that we have. But uh, let me give you seven reasons for a big day. And this is just preliminary to the message. Number one, it gets more people door knocking than normal or at least passing out tracks than normal. All right, normally, and, and we do pretty well with tracks. I don't know exactly how many folks are giving out tracks, but I know that uh, we, we go through around 2,000 tracks a month. And uh, so I know somebody's giving them out and uh, giving out the material. So that's a good thing. But, you know, this gets a lot of people involved. I said this morning 30 different families are passing out the flyers. And I'm sure there's a few more as of that list this morning. And uh, that's, that's above average, okay? That's, that gets people involved who are not normally involved. And, and it is the idea of getting the gospel out. The idea of getting the gospel into homes. That's why we don't just put a flyer out. We put the plan of salvation on the back of the flyer. Because uh, whether, whether someone ever comes to the dinner or not, if they just keep that in their house, on the back side they have the plan of salvation. And they can know how they can be saved and how they can know they have eternal life. And so it gets people uh, involved more door knocking than usual. Number two, it gets people excited. It's exciting to see the auditorium full. It's exciting when we have to put down some extra chairs. It's exciting to see every, feet, every seat uh, filled in with people. Uh, that's an exciting thing. And so it's good to see that. See, it's good to see a tent go up and, and visitors come in and, and faces you don't usually see. And that's an exciting time. That's good. 
and it's good for us to have that. Number three, it goes along with number two, it kind of helps get a church out of the doldrums, the routine, the just the, 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 the every week, okay, we come, we do this, I go home, blah, 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 okay? And uh, kind of gets us out of that. The routine is broken, and it gives some freshness to us, okay? It's a good thing. Number four, it gives us a lot of prospects. There'll be many first-time visitors. Usually we have a stack of cards of people who've been here for the first time that we get to go back and visit them. And so we get a lot of prospects out of having a big day. Number five, we're carrying out the Great Commission. We're preaching the gospel. And, and people will be saved. Through the years, 182 people have received Christ as their Savior on Turkey Dinner Sunday. Of those 182, 73 have been baptized. And so we, we know that that's the great commission, is to preach the gospel to every creature. And that's the great goal of having a dinner day. That's why we, go, we get 10,000 flyers out. That's why we, we advertise it. That's why we get the turkeys. And that's why we make the meal and we serve the meal and we get everything ready and rent a tent and do all that we do. Why? For that reason right there. We want to see people saved. We want to see the gospel go forth, all right? Number six, it provides a place of service for many people. On that day coming up, uh, at various places throughout the church, on Sunday we'll have 70 different people doing something on Sunday, serving in some way. And uh, that's tremendous. Uh, that's, that's what it's all about. People getting involved, people serving, realizing, hey, you know what? God will use me. And He will, all right? So it helps us have a place of service. And then number seven, it publicizes the church. People can't respond to something they don't know is there. Okay? There's times we go out every year and, and people say, now where are you? And you're trying to describe where they are and, and finally it'll light up to them. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I, I know where you are. Or, and, and before, they've never given it a thought. Uh, they didn't know, you know, you, 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 they don't know you're here. And so it, it, it gives good publicity uh, to the church. So when we have the big day, we can pattern it after the Bible big day here at Pentecost, okay? And let me give you some practical things here about the big day of Pentecost. Number one is there was a multitude of people. In Acts 2, in verse 1, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, all, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, and saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? We mentioned about that, how all these nations were together and gathered there in Jerusalem. Now understand, that it's not unusual in our day to have that, but it was unusual in their day to have that, but it's not unusual in our day. The greater population now, I looked it up today, of the greater Columbus area, that's Columbus and its suburbs, is now 2.4 million people. 2.4 million people. The metro area, that's made up of 1.5 million white people, Caucasian if you will, 308,400 black residents, 81,141 Hispanic residents, 79,900 Asian residents, and then 58,000 other minorities. The most common foreign languages in Columbus, Ohio metro area are Spanish. Just under 50,000 Spanish speaker people in Columbus. African languages, 26,000. Chinese, just under 13,000 Chinese speakers. I don't know why I'm looking at you, but I am. <laughs> looking, at, looking at Mr. Japanese over there, but uh, that's amazing. There's, there's also Cambodian and, and Laotian. Uh, I mean, hey, what are we saying? The harvest is plenteous. The harvest is plenteous. We're in a tremendous harvest field called Columbus, Ohio. When we put our, our ad for the, 
for the dinner day on Facebook, and they have a radius of how far you want that to reach. And a, boy, a 30-mile radius reaches hundreds of thousands of people. It's just amazing. The, the reach and the number of people that are within a 30-minute drive of Bible Baptist Church. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. So God has given us a great, har- uh, a great harvest of people. There are, there are multitudes of people here, okay? And so we have the multitudes of people just as they did. Number two, I want you to notice much preparation went into this day. Now for that, look at chapter 1 with me, will you? Chapter 1 and verse 12. They returned, they returned, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. So Jesus has ascended back to heaven. They watched him go up. And now they're going to do what Jesus said. They said, you're going to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So they went and they gathered in an upper room, 120 of them. And what were they going to do there? They're going to pray. They're going to pray. And you find out they prayed one day. They prayed two days. They prayed three days. Now, I don't think that they just stayed up there for 10 straight days. I think they might have had other responsibilities and other things they went to do. But they continued, it says, in prayer. So whether they all were there at one time or whether they had a chain kind of thing going and someone was always there praying, but they were praying. And they were waiting for the promise of the Father, waiting for what Jesus had said would come. Prayer changes things. Prayer, by the way, sometimes prayer changes us. And we change some things, okay? But prayer has divided seas, prayer has rolled up rivers, prayer has made rocks gush forth water, prayer has quenched the flames of fire, prayer has muzzled the mouths of lions, prayer has opened the windows of heaven, prayer has bridled and changed the passions of man, prayer has destroyed the armies of the proud, prayer brought Jonah up from the depths of the sea, and it carried Elijah up to heaven in a chariot of fire. Prayer. Prayer. What hasn't prayer done you cannot tell you cannot think of anything that prayer has not done prayer we can do more after we pray but we cannot do anything until we pray so i say we can labor and we can work but if we don't pray and make sure that we know that we need god then then our big day won't be a big day at all the preparation was prayer prayer they prepared as workers. They, they replaced Judas with Matthias and, and made him the twelfth apostle. Uh, they knew they'd need everybody. And you've heard me stress that already. We need everybody. All, all hands on deck. Okay? We need everybody serving and working and, and the full complement of workers, the assignments you have that are posted. You know, there's no, there's no backup. There's no plan B. If you're not here, then... Uh, we, uh, the fewer people have to carry the pole like we talked about this morning, okay? And it can be done, but it's going to be a lot harder and take its toll on workers, okay? So they had preparation. Then I want you to notice number three, that the main event was preaching in chapter 2 and verse number 14. Acts 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. And then Peter goes on to preach. He quotes some Old Testament Scripture, and he brings the message. It was preaching. Drop down, if you will, to verse number 40, where the Bible says, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Peter preached publicly. Now, I don't think that there was a huge crowd there and Peter preached and 3,000 came forward in invitation. I think Peter had a preaching, but I think others were preaching privately. I think others were giving the gospel because, again, there were at least 19 nations there and everybody heard the gospel in their own language. So there had to be at least 19 preachers uh, and people fanning out amongst them and preaching the gospel. And, And both are needed for a big day to be successful. 
Nothing wrong with this week if, if some of you who are soul winners, you just say, I'm going to go out this week with the purpose of trying to win others to Christ. I want to try to see them saved and then bring them Sunday to church. They've already been saved, and when the invitation's given, we'll just bring them forward. Uh, and that helps others who are in the service, who are not saved, to come forward to receive Christ. It always helps when other people are moving and other people are coming forward. But the idea is we're going to preach the gospel. It still pleases God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And so with the main event is still the preaching of God's Word. God always honors preaching. So the main event will be preaching. And it was preaching there in the book of Acts. Then notice verse number 40 again that the invitation was given. Peter says, here's what you have to do. Save yourself from this untoward generation. And he said, They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So the invitation was given. In other words, a decision. They brought these people to a decision. Here's what you need to do. We give the gospel when folks come on a special Sunday like dinner day. And we bring them to a decision. What will you do with Jesus Christ? What will you do with the one who died on the cross for you? Will you receive him as your Savior? Will you reject him? Not to receive him is to reject him. You make a decision either way. If you say, I'm not going to make a decision, you made a decision. You made a decision not to receive him as your Savior. And so we're going to bring them to a decision. It grieves my heart at times when, when we hear that of the many programs that go into the prison, and we, we've heard from prisoners saying of the of one, one guy goes to 22 different religious programs. I think he'd probably be more mixed up than a termite and a yo-yo, but uh, he's, he's going to all these programs, but he said you're the only group that gives the gospel and invites men to be saved. Well, see, I don't understand that. We're, bringing, we're, we're there to bring them to a decision. To what will you do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? What will you do with Him? And will you receive Him as your Savior? Uh, hold your finger there in Acts 2. Just go forward a little bit to Acts 14. Would you look there with me, please? Acts 14. This is... Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. And they come to Iconium in chapter 14 and verse 1. Do you notice, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. Now watch. And so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Gentiles, did what? Believed. Why did a great multitude of Jews and Gentiles both believe? Because somebody so spake so they could believe. Okay? We're going we're gonna to so speak that a multitude can believe. We're going to so speak, we have so, so uh, spoken uh, through the years that 173 have believed and received Christ as their Savior. All right? So speak that people can be saved. And that's, uh, that's why we give an invitation. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, in fact, it changed D.L. Moody's ministry. D.L. Moody was preaching and, and preaching Christ and preaching the gospel. Had a great crowd there that night. And as he presented Christ and the claims of Christ and the desire for him to save the people's soul and for them to trust Christ as their Savior, he said, I want you to go home tonight. I want you to think about what you've heard and then come back again tomorrow night and, 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 and make having made your decision for Christ. And he dismissed the meeting. But that night was the night of the great Chicago fire. And many of those people perished that night. And they never had opportunity to come back. And that so impressed D.L. Moody. And he said, I'll never again hold a meeting without bringing people to a decision to receive Christ as their Savior right then. Not to delay. Not to wait. You heard me say before, if ever, if ever when it comes to salvation and, and all you hear is the word wait or tomorrow, that's not God telling you that. God's Word when it comes to salvation is always now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you need to decide for Christ. None of us are promised tomorrow. Doesn't matter your age. We, uh, we, we heard the testimony, I think it was uh, James the other night, 
where a, a fellow took his five-year-old son to the doctor with the flu, and, and I think five days later he passed away. Five years old. My friend, you don't know. You don't know. Terry Lynn, as some of you heard about her, her sister, three years younger than she, taken in a car accident, I think on Friday night. Wasn't expecting that. The people who were, were, were shot up originally in the synagogue in Pittsburgh or in the yoga place down in Florida, they had no idea that would be their last day on earth. We just don't know. What I do know is, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. And so, don't put off receiving Christ. Don't put off if you know that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. Jesus is a Savior you need. And you trust Him as your Savior. And you do it now. Don't put it off. So the invitation will be given. And then we find out, of course, number five, many decisions were made. In verse 41, 3,000 were saved and baptized. And if we pray and preach and prepare and give the invitation, then we expect people to respond and receive Christ as their Savior. You find out that later on, uh, 5,000 believed, and then later on, it stops counting. It just says multitudes were added to the Lord. Uh, they didn't bother counting the numbers. There were so many. And so salvations were being made, decisions were being made, and by the way, that brought the number six, the church grew. Notice in verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. You know, anything that, alive, that is alive grows. Understand that? Anything that's alive grows. And the Lord added to the church. Churches ought to be growing. Okay? We're not a club. Clubs don't have to grow. Clubs are happy with us four and no more. Okay? We're not a club. We're church. And Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And so the church is to be growing because the church is alive. And, and so the church will be growing. And so we're, we're in a growing city. We're in a growing area. Boy, Grove City's grown so much in the 13 years we've been here. It's amazing the expansion of Grove City. And, and, and look, then the church ought to grow. Amen? Amen. The church ought to grow. And, and, by, the, and by the way, you've got to really grow to grow. We, I was adding up here, and I haven't done it recently. It's been about a month ago. Uh, we've, had, we've, we've had 21 people either move away or stop coming to church in, in 2018. So if we're going to grow, we have to get at least 21 just to get back to even. And then we've got to get more than that to grow. But God's doing that. God's doing that. And we've got a pretty good crowd even on Sunday night. And, and you understand, churches are to grow. And so, uh, it, so many churches are not what they ought to be. One little boy was looking at an abstract painting. He asked his mom, what is that? She said, well, it's supposed to be a cow hand and his horse. And then the little boy looked at his mom and said, then why ain't it? And that's a good question. The church of Jesus Christ is to be preaching the gospel winning souls to Christ, and seeing the Lord grow His church. And if that's not happening, then we have to ask ourselves, why ain't it? Why ain't it happening? And what, or what do we need to do to change it? The gospel's the same, isn't it? The Savior's the same. God is the same. He doesn't change. So if the problem isn't the gospel, and the problem isn't God, and the problem isn't the Savior, I think I know where the problem is. It must lay on our end of things. So let's do our part and let's see God build His church. And then number seven, God gave, they gave God the glory. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. They were praising God. You know why? It's God's work. It's God's church. And, and it's for His glory, not for our glory. Everything that's done is to be done for God, not for us. It's not about us. It's about God. And we're, we're, we're His, and all we have is because of Him. We may be able to work and be able to, to serve, but the only way we can do that is because God gives us the ability to do that. God could put any one of us flat on our back 
tonight and we wouldn't be able to do a thing. So it's by the grace of God we do what we do. And we give Him the glory and the praise for that. So we have multitudes of people, much preparation, much preaching. The invitation was given. Many decisions were made. The church grew and God received the glory. Now I just want to add something to that tonight. Look at Matthew chapter 8 with me, would you please? Matthew chapter 8. Just an addendum to that part of the big day and, and prayerfully multitudes that will come. We're asking God to give us a couple hundred, several hundred to come. Notice in Matthew 8, when He, that's Jesus, verse 1, when He was come down from the mountain, who followed Him? Great multitudes followed Him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped Him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand in what, church? He touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now think about this. He's coming down from the mountain. Great multitudes are following him. Not only those who wanted to hear him, but those who were trying to catch him. Scribes, Pharisees, trying to trip him up, trying to hear him say something he shouldn't say. Trying to test his wisdom trying to wonder by what authority this man speaks, wanting to hear his teaching, wondering if this was indeed a new prophet. I mean, I'm sure the word was out, come hear this man of wisdom. Never a man spake like this man. And I'm sure it was a, 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 quite a draw. You understand, in those days, there, there wasn't a, nobody had a phone to look at. Nobody had a tablet to look at. Nobody had a television to look at. They didn't have anything to distract them. When someone came and they were a teacher, they attracted a crowd. And Jesus attracted the crowd. And here He is with this crowd following Him and a leper came. Now let me ask you a question. Would you stop ministering to the multitudes to take time for a leper? To stop it all and say, okay, you guys all wait a minute. I want to talk to this guy right here. He said, oh no, you can't interrupt th this lesson to multitudes by talking to one guy. One man, especially an outcast. I mean, I'm sure you could feel some of the rejection in the air when the leper got near because nobody wanted to go near him. I'm sure as he got closer to Jesus, everybody kind of parted the way. Because leprosy was very contagious. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He's supposed to stay away from everybody. He's unclean. And, and surely you, you would look and say, well, I'm sure some of his disciples are going to run this guy off. I'm sure they're going to uh, get him off the scene. By the way, having, having a leper come in, that's going to scare some of the some of the more acceptable people away from following Jesus. They're not going to follow Jesus if that guy follows Him. We're not sure we want that kind of guy. Notice Jesus put forth His hand and touched Him. What, what's the one thing you don't do to a leper? Don't touch Him. Jesus did. That someone he touched, I want you to understand, happened to be a no one to everybody else. But he was someone to Jesus. Next Sunday, we'll have some no ones come in who are no one to society, but they're someone to Jesus. And we have to understand that. Some in the crowd would have found a reason to cross to the other side. Not to find it disgusting that that kind of a fellow would be allowed to get that close to Jesus or that certainly Jesus wouldn't want to reach out and touch him. They'd be afraid to be contaminated by his disease, both physically and socially. Well, I don't want to be seen with that kind of a person. Will you reach out 
and touch somebody next Sunday whose life may be unacceptable to many others? They'll be here. They'll be here. Some of the outcasts of society. Well, it doesn't have, probably won't be a leper, but it could be an addict. Could be one was an alcoholic. Could be an ex-convict. They'll, they'll be here. People who society keeps at an arm's length and doesn't want uh, doesn't want to be associated with that kind. But Jesus reached out to him. Well, I'm not on the list and to do anything. Can you reach out and touch somebody next week? Will you watch the people who come in and pray and say, Lord, who do you want me to minister to here? And we can have numbers of people who just are touching people's lives. Don't, don't sit with the same three or four people from church. Sit with somebody you don't know. Sit down with the guests that come and, and minister to them. Get to know them. Touch them. Touch them. Let them know Jesus cares about them. But he's not done. Look again at, at chapter 8. So he takes care of the leper. His leprosy was cleansed. Verse 5. Now Jesus entered into Capernaum. And the same crowd stood with him. And there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus saith unto him, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. Thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and another come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, it shall be done unto thee. So it be done. So be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. Now he's going along, and here comes a Roman soldier. Let me ask you a question: How how loved were the Roman soldiers by the Jewish community? <laughs> no. What's this guy doing interrupting Jesus? He's come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What's this Gentile doing here? He doesn't belong here. And he's asking, to, not, not for him, he's asking for a servant of his to be healed. Again, a Roman captain, a servant who's paralyzed or ill. Hey, we have a lot of people in, in our group that are sick. A lot of people in our group, what's he listening to him for? Jesus stopped. The man, the Roman soldier, humbled himself and believed that Jesus could heal his servant. And Jesus did. Jesus did. So he stops to minister to the servant of one of the enemies of the Jews. But he's not done. Look at verse 14. So now Jesus, when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. All right, now remember, he's taught the multitudes. He's come across the leper. The leper came to him. He heals the leper. He continues to teach, and the centurion comes up and wants him to heal his servant. He takes time to speak with him and and rewards his faith that Jesus could do it by speaking the word. And then finally he gets to Peter's house. Time to rest. Time to, time to relax a little bit. He gets into Peter's house and he says, My wife's mother has got a fever. And Jesus said, Well, it's a mother in law, it's okay. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. Huh? And he could have said, hey, you know what? I, I'm a little, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about the leper. I'm more concerned about the guy who's paralyzed or near death. 
I, I deal with the big cases. You got a fever, take two aspirin, call me in the morning. But he didn't do that. He could have looked at the, the now I know they didn't have these, but he could have looked at the sofa, you know, could have looked at the TV, the recliner, say, boy, that looks pretty good right now. Let's get something to eat, to drink, let me relax. I've been working hard all day. Not another sick person. But he didn't respond that way. Somebody had a need. And so he reached out and he touched her hand. And the fever left her. You know what you see here? Jesus was never too busy to stop and touch someone who needed help. Isn't that a rebuke to us? When so often we're so busy. Don't get so busy next week in what you have to do that you don't stop to touch somebody. To help somebody. Years ago, well I don't know how many years ago it was, Stephanie Paz came. I want to say maybe 2011. Stephanie at that time had five little girls. Let's see. The oldest one just graduated last May. So she's 18, so you subtract seven years. She was 11. And then the other ones were much younger than that. Four younger girls, all of them I think, seven and under or six or eight and under. Just little girls. And and Stephanie, Stephanie was saved. She was baptized. The girls, some of the girls got saved, the older ones. But she, she ended up coming to church so she moved to New Mexico. And she said, you know what impressed her when she was here? The people that said, can we help you? Let us get a plate for your girls. Let us help you go through the line. And people took plates and helped her get her girls food and found a place for her to sit. Went and got them drinks and brought it to the table. She said, everybody was so willing to help me. That touched her heart. Can I tell you, church, there'll be other Stephanies here next Sunday. People here who we can touch. Who God will use us to touch. So don't get so caught up in all the other... I've said this so often when we have big days. You Something will happen and you'll want to get upset. You'll want to get sideways about it. Just, just take out a piece of paper, write it down, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at this Monday morning and see if I still want to be upset about it. Okay? Because that's what, that's what the devil will do to rob you of a blessing and to keep you from touching somebody else on November 11th. A song that we don't sing as a congregation. It's a special. It's been around for quite a few years now. It's called People Need the Lord. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care. Headed who knows where. On they go through private pain. Living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through His love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life. Only we can share. People need the Lord. They'll come. Let's work. Let's prepare. Let's pray. Let's, let's ask God to bring them and when He does, let's minister to them. Let's touch them. 
It's not, let's not see the multitudes. Let's look for those individuals that God wants us to touch. Let's minister to people on November 11. Amen? Amen? Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this pattern in the Bible of a big day. Thank you, Lord, for your example that though you had multitudes following you, you took time for the individual. You took time to minister to individual people. And Lord, we want a multitude here next Sunday. We want the house to be filled as Luke 16 and the Great Supper speaks about. And I believe you would want that as well. But Lord, help us not just to see the crowd. Help us to see individuals. People here that are hurting. As we go out this week and we carry the flyers with us, help us to see folks who need someone to reach out and touch them. Give us the ability to minister to people and to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 